Thank you for joining us today. Just a very uh, few quick reminders before we get started. All attendees are on mute. If you're using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end. This session is TLP White and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator, Graciela Martinez. Graciela, take it away. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the conference and thank you for joining the session, New Age, New Rules. Your speakers will be Dr. Sherif Hashem and Martin von Horenbeek. Dr. Sherif Hashem is a visiting professor of computer and information sciences at the SUNY Polytechnic Institute at New York, USA. Martin von Horenbeck is chief information security officer at Zendesk and a board member of the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams first. So we can start the talk just right now. Thank you, both of you. Thank you very much, Graciela, and thank you very much, everyone, for attending the talk today. So Sharif and I are here today to talk a little bit about governments and how they see incident response, specifically at a very international level. When you think about incident response, I think many of us on the call uh, or on the, the presentation come from a world where a lot of incident response was purely technical. We reacted to an incident. We worked with a ver variety of stakeholders to address those issues. Um, but overall, like we took technical actions and quite often we were not really very, scru very much scrutinized by governments and some of our government stakeholders. That has changed in the last few years with big incidents such as NotPetya, Stuxnet and Triton or Trisis. What we're seeing is that governments have taken a really, really big interest in what is actually happening in the incident response realm. And it's very important for us to understand that those governments and those stakeholders that come more from the policy world have a very different perspective of what we do than we actually have within our community. Quite often when you talk to these people, you actually hear that they think of us a little bit as the police department, because when someone does a forensic investigation, that's typically a police officer. So that's often something that comes to mind. And in this talk today, we'll share with you a little bit about how governments have been thinking and organizing what FIRST and other organizations are doing to provide input, and also maybe a little bit why we need to help those diplomats and policymakers understand why perhaps the police isn't the best analogy for a CSER. And with that, I'll hand it off to Sharif, who will introduce us to some of these intra-intergovernmental processes that have been taking place in the last few years. Sharif, you may be on mute if you're speaking. Uh, hi, C can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, yeah. thanks, Martin. Uh, well, uh, the United Nations realized uh, in 2004 that, uh, uh, the, I mean, the immense use of ICT across different uh, uh, applications across different sectors uh, require some coordination and the UN General Assembly in 2004 established uh, uh, one of the really important groups that uh, are quite relevant to our talk today which is the UN the group of governmental experts to examine the impact of I mean the development of ICT on international peace uh, basically there are uh, these are groups of governmental experts uh, one expert per country initially the group started with like uh, 15 countries only so imagine like 15 uh, uh, experts only dealing with this issue i had the privilege of being a part of this group in 2012 2013 i was the only one from africa and the middle east actually uh, so it's about 60 countries and 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 uh, then i mean we lobbied to expand the group we lobbied to have more uh, inclusion of uh, uh, non-governmental uh, uh, i mean uh, organizations uh, uh, I mean, professional uh, entities. And as such, uh, uh, that group expanded to include now 25 members. There were uh, six uh, group of governmental experts since 2004. Uh, however, only six, uh, three of the six groups uh, uh, ended up with a consensus on a report that was uh, uh, later on adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations. The UN General Assembly is important because that's 
where you have membership of all countries there at equal footage. We also lobbied for uh, openness in these discussions and as such, uh, uh, the UN agreed uh, to a recommendation to establish an open-ended working group where we invite uh, uh, non-governmental uh, uh, representatives. Uh, first was invited to the launching event. Uh, I had the privilege, and Martin uh, also uh, had the privilege to address uh, the group in different capacities. Uh, uh, I think this is very important to continue. I would like uh, to emphasize here that, that the UNGG uh, falls under the uh, UN uh, First Committee, which is the main committee of the General Assembly. And as such, it's very important to engage with them. Uh, this is really a highway to, to reach the UN at the uh, highest possible level. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, the two groups, I need to emphasize really the membership, and that would reflect on the type of work that uh, is being done at this point. Uh, now we have a UNGGE group, a group of governmental experts that started off in the 2019 and uh, uh, the mandate uh, is to produce a report based again hopefully on consensus. Uh, uh, by 2021, the group focus on norms, rules and principles for uh, building confidence and uh, 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 confidence building measures and capacity building uh, at, at large. Uh, while the open-ended working group, uh, which is chaired by the uh, Swiss diplomat, uh, it, it has more membership, NGOs are there, businesses are there, academia, and of course government is there also. And they started off in 2019, the mandate was to develop a report by 2020, by, but due to the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, uh, that was extended uh, uh, to 2021. I encourage all members of FIRST to, to really engage with their representatives, whether at the country level, like uh, what we lobbied for uh, with the UNGGE uh, situation, uh, uh, because that's, I mean, the, the highway really to the UN uh, Assembly, as I mentioned before. And that's uh, how we can have more uh, uh, really hands-on uh, experience, especially from this, from FIRST, uh, being a forum for incident and, uh, response and security teams, people who are uh, first responders, people who really know about uh, uh, how to handle incidents and how to deal with escalations uh, with diplomats. Uh, I remember in my earlier experience with the UNGGE, uh, I was the only non-diplomat among uh, 15 experts. And you see the discussions there. I mean, many of the diplomats wanted to use articles that were used for uh, weapons of mass destruction in nuclear and chemical uh, cases. And, and of course, some of these uh, uh, discussions are not relevant when it comes to uh, cybersecurity uh, or uh, dealing with incidents, uh, cyber incidents. Uh, uh, specifically, there are two issues that I'd like to uh, raise, uh, I mean, uh, awareness of discussions about attribution, how to relate uh, really uh, a certain incident to uh, certain actors, whether they are state actors or non-state actors. Uh, I mean, in a, a traditional uh, attack with, uh, I mean, uh, traditional weapons, uh, it, it is easier uh, to, to do the investigation uh, as opposed to in cyberspace where you have, you know, uh, proxies and you have uh, really uh, ways of spoofing addresses and so on and so forth. So having uh, uh, some liability articles there without proper Adre uh, properly addressing attribution could be uh, dangerous. And again, this is an area where, uh, uh, I mean, instant responders uh, can help educate decision makers in their countries and their uh, agencies, uh, and hopefully representative in, in both groups of, of this situation. Uh, another point that uh, could have reflected the negatively on really some of the article is uh, the concept of, uh, or the interpretation of the concept of pro for, for, uh, proportionality when it comes to uh, a really retaliation or a really a, a state uh, uh, taking measures against an attack. In, in uh, uh, cyberspace, uh, an attack can uh, uh, really escalate because of interdependencies. Uh, an attack on infrastructure can affect hospitals, can affect banks, can affect individuals in different capacities. So again, uh, uh, we need to educate decision makers again when, when it comes to accepting such norms that uh, uh, proportionality and interdependencies in the cyber world are, are uh, quite different 
than in the physical world. Uh, another concept that was also discussed uh, uh, several times and uh, still uh, uh, really uh, pops up every now and then is the, uh, the right to have preemptive strikes, uh, 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 cyber offensive capabilities. You'll see some voices lobbying for this to happen. Uh, this is not something uh, uh, that should be taken uh, e easily uh, and, and definitely uh, uh, it would have uh, uh, an impact on international peace. Uh, your role as uh, incident responders could be uh, really instrumental in educating decision makers about the consequences of actions and reactions. Uh, uh, in, in our discussion of norms, you know, there are uh, rules of uh, the highways and uh, uh, there are legal uh, uh, implications as well as uh, agreements that are not uh, legally binding but they are uh, I, I mean uh, shared among uh, stakeholders like norms uh, at this point cyber norms are discussed at a level of consensus between uh, governments and would be a basis for uh, how we uh, behave in cyberspace whether as uh, individuals as professionals or at large or between states uh, this is one step below having an international treaty when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, uh, cyber security. Uh, I'll share quickly with you some norms uh, for those of you who are interested. Uh, there are, uh, we can have, I mean, the, the presentation is there and there are links that would uh, guide you to, to see where the discussions uh, are heading. The last, I mean, UNGGE that came up with a consensus report was in 2015, and it uh, states uh, uh, certain norms uh, that were accepted by the way, this is, has been accepted by the UN General Assembly. So this is the basis for many of the discussions ongoing on uh, right now. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, you, you can agree that they are logical and the way they are set uh, there. I mean, it, it is quite a good basis of how states should do uh, and uh, should not do, uh, the state should not engage in harmful uh, uh, acts that would uh, uh, threats international peace and security, uh, uh, that uh, states should consider all relevant information and share it in an open, transparent way, and uh, shouldn't encourage uh, illegal actors to use their infrastructure. Uh, again, there is a mention uh, of really the rights to privacy, uh, uh, the, uh, really the, some measures uh, against attacking critical infrastructure and, and uh, 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 um, uh, in the attacking the integrity of supply chain. Uh, uh, one norm really is directed to uh, certs. You'll see number 11 here uh, uh, about states should not uh, attack, uh, uh, I mean, uh, emergency response teams or cert uh, capabilities. This is something that we negotiated in 2012, 2013. So I'm really pleased to have this in, I mean, inside because, I mean, uh, the perception that these certs are uh, uh, for, I mean, mostly uh, for civilian uh, support and to protect uh, uh, really uh, uh, general usage of uh, ICTs is, is very important. Uh, confidence building measures are important, are parallel to the norms where you have uh, the focus on uh, really uh, agreeing on a basis to build uh, uh, confidence ahead of having a crisis. Uh, it is not uh, really uh, appropriate really to try to build new relationships during a crisis time. Uh, probably it's too late. Uh, however, uh, working on confidence building measures, and I believe first could be the, uh, one of the forum that would help build this com uh, confidence uh, among key players, uh, establishing points of contact, establishing uh, uh, support for uh, voluntarily sharing uh, information on incidents, mechanisms uh, uh, for cooperation should be set ahead of time. Uh, all these norms are, are uh, confidence building measures uh, rather are, are important to strengthen international uh, peace and security. Uh, certs are in the middle of all this. Uh, so again, I would encourage you uh, by engaging to uh, the two modalities uh, within the UN, whether the open-ended uh, working group or uh, uh, at the governmental level with the UNGGE, to emphasize the importance of confidence building measures and to emphasize the importance of government supporting this role and uh, really opening up. Because I mean, the work of certs, and I have my experience in my home country, Egypt, where uh, our cert would collaborate or with certs all around the world to prevent uh, uh, cyber attacks, DDoS attacks, and others, uh, and, and that is instrumental in the success of, of our mission as incident responders. 
Uh, back to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Sharif. So a really interesting question is how do these norms actually come to be? Is it just someone who makes them up and then discusses them? Or is this something that actually has a process attached to it? And there's a definition of norms that's widely accepted to be the one that most people use today. It comes from a researcher called Katzenstein, who in 1996 wrote that a norm is a collective expectation for the proper behavior of actors with a given identity. So for instance, things that we expect states to do, it might not always be described, but if we expect them to do it, that is often a norm or an indication that we expect that the states to adhere to a particular norm. They're often identified by people that perceive a need or when they are contested. And I'll actually use an example of that. So for instance, when there was um, an attack or uh, a cyber incident at uh, Sony Pictures Entertainment a few years ago, and it was attributed by several governments to be initiated by a state. At that point in time, there was a lot of discussion that it would not be appropriate for a state to attack a private sector company. Now, that isn't necessarily one of the norms that is currently being uh, discussed at those very high levels, but it was clearly something where a lot of individuals um, and organizations stood up and engaged in what we call norms entrepreneurship to make it clear that this was something that they were not willing to accept from states. So when you have norms, they come to be and they grow in a very specific process that requires some time. They first emerge. Some individuals start noticing that something is happening which they do not agree with, and they start contesting that particular behavior and saying this should not happen. And that can be through uh, legal complaints. It can be by um, just uh, activism against that idea. It can be by proposing language that actually makes clear something that this shouldn't happen. The next thing is that the idea starts cascading or not. What that means is that the um, idea that is suggested by a number of different organizations and people that is emerging ends up moving through the system and more and more actors start stating that they agree or disagree with that particular norm. And finally, as it is widely accepted by different actors, uh, those actors start internalizing it. So for instance, if a whole group of governments agree something shouldn't happen, they might start putting together processes, implementations, organizations to make sure that that specific activity will never take place. Next slide, Sharif. So Sharif mentioned two very specific processes, the UN group of governmental experts and the open-ended working group that are happening at an interstate level today. In the case of the OEWG, also involves some other organizations and even gave an opportunity, for instance, the first to provide some input to that group. But there are also other places where norms development and norms entrepreneurship takes place. And in the next slide, I'll show you briefly what type of organizations have really engaged in this. Uh, next slide, thank you. So these are three examples of proposed norms by three different bodies. There's the UNGGE who proposed a norm that states should never knowingly support activity to harm sea certs of another state. There's a proposal by the Global uh, Com Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, which stated that states should not pursue support or allow cyber operations intended to disrupt technical infrastructure related to elections. And finally, there's a very old proposal from Microsoft uh, that was actually one of the first real examples of norms entrepreneurship from a private sector company that stated that global ICT companies should issue patches to protect IT users regardless of the attacker and their motives. And we've actually seen development of these types of norms in many, many different communities. And it's a very interesting space because I think most people look at the GGE as sort of the top level normative organization as in they are proposing norms that are actually seeing widespread acceptance by states, which has a lot of influence. There's also a lot of work happening in these other bodies. And sometimes you see ideas from there bubbling up and getting more credibility in other bodies as well. For instance, the GCSE had a very interesting norm to protect the public core of the internet, which is one that is widely looked at by many different organizations and proposed to many different bodies as an actual um, cyber norm. Moving into the next slide, um, I wanted to start sharing with you a little bit of what FIRST has done in this space. So FIRST, as an organization, um, we have a lot of incident response teams that are members of FIRST. What was very interesting to us was a few years ago, we had a couple of talks at the conference where we actually talked about that CSERT-related norm 
that I just showed, and that was also on Sharif's slides in the very beginning of the talk. And it was very interesting to realize that most C certs actually had no idea that that norm existed. So in order to address this, we're doing two things. First of all, we're bringing content from these organizations to all of you as part of the conference, as part of emails, as part of a special interest group that we are launching. And at the same time, we're also bringing content from all of you and ideas from all of you uh, that is collected through the special interest group back to these bodies like the United States. So we actually engaged, we went to New York, uh, Sharif and I did a lot of work to provide input to these bodies. And in the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. We have so 10 minutes left. Thank you, Graciela. So um, what we're really doing is we're having informal conversations with individual participants in the UNGGE because we don't necessarily have direct access there. We're formally participating in the open-ended working group as a civil society organization that went to their civil society meeting to provide input. And finally, we also contributed uh, both directly and as part of feedback that was actually compiled by other civil society and technical community organizations directly to these bodies. Now, the next slide will show you what our key message really is. And it's very simple. It is that C-certs are not the police, they're more like fire departments. When an incident happens, we need to have the independence, the ability to work across borders to deal with the incident effectively. And fire departments do that all the time. Like they go to different jurisdictions to help other fire departments take out really, really big fires. And that's really what we want these diplomats to see us as. And on the next two slides, we'll show you a little bit about the key things that we're focusing on. The first one is that we want these organizations and in particular, the states within the United Nations to emphasize partnership and inclusion. And we want them to double down on capacity building. So we want them to focus on collaboration and enabling different organizations, not just states and national incident response teams, but all incident response teams to build a community. And Sharif, you, um, you can speak to the last two. Okay, well, uh, and raising awareness is key to the success of such efforts, uh, raising awareness at all levels, the community level, then, I mean, uh, uh, at all levels, basically, we can uh, uh, impact, uh, uh, I mean, policymakers, diplomats, I've given talks uh, and workshops where, where diplomats are there, decision makers, uh, uh, NGOs, uh, professional talks, like what we're doing now at first, uh, everybody needs to really share and uh, to be open about norms and, and uh, share about uh, experiences about their impact and what really certs are, are uniquely positioned uh, to do this uh, is, is really uh, could be an efficient way of making these norms a reality, not just a statement. Thank you. And then finally, we don't just provide input on the norms process. We also actually provide some input directly on policy that we think is important. The very first statement that we shared with these organizations is that we believe it's very important to adopt practical measures to make sure that everyone understands each other's roles and responsibilities. And we actually used Ethics First, which was initiated and developed within FIRST as an example of an initiative that actually accomplishes this for incident responders. We also asked governments to think about how policy can negatively affect C-certs. For instance, when um, technical expertise is criminalized or you can't use tools across borders, that makes it very difficult for us to be successful. Third, we asked them to think about allowing sharing of defensive cybersecurity information across borders. Within FIRST, we've seen quite a bit in the last few years how sanctions and export restrictions have made our life a lot more difficult. In fact, as FIRST, we're spending more and more money on figuring out how we can actually allow incident responders from across the world to participate. And that's not something that will scale or work for us because we need to work at incidents at the speed of the incident, which is almost always immediate. And we can't take days or weeks to try and get licenses to work with another incident response team. And we also encourage these governments to look beyond the work that they have done and look at work that has happened within the technical community. And a good example here is actually the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace and their norm to protect the public core of the internet. When there's a norm that you should not be attacking the certificate authority or web PKI system, that is actually helpful to us because it makes incidents a lot more predictable and a lot more isolated and doesn't create as much um, outcome for the rest of the internet that we're trying to protect. 
And then Sharif actually came up with this very last one, which I think summarizes really very, very well what it is that we as a community want to create. Cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. We, we would like to promote this uh, really uh, a common understanding across different uh, stakeholders. They need to understand the roles. It is not a technology or a technical problem handled by, by the third or ICT professionals. Otherwise, it will become our problem rather than the global problem or the government problem or the people's problem. It is our shared responsibility to secure uh, cyberspace, to make sure that, uh, I mean, illicit uh, activities are cornered, are uh, investigated properly, and, and as such, they are not the norm. What uh, Martin just mentioned about export control, we have faced this in, in, uh, in numerous ways where developing capacity in our certain Egypt, where certain technologies were limited in terms of uh, exports. And, and as such, criminals have access of, uh, within the underground uh, networks to such uh, really technologies. It is the instant responders that suffer the most from uh, regulations that hinder their ability to get access to the technology. Uh, uh, definitely the civil society, the professional, the, the NGOs need to be part of this effort. It's a shared responsibility that need to be understood and addressed by all. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you all for uh, following and maybe we have a few minutes for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Sheriff uh, Martin. And we have a, a um, participant that she would like to, she raised her hand. And I think that she would like to participate. So to ask her question. Um, Sorry, I have to look at her. Okay, I have to allow her, the speaker, to speak. Uh, so I, 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 it looked like I have raised the hand, but I have yes. just probably clicked okay. somewhere. So hi, I hi, Marie. I'm sorry. So <laughs> we have some two minutes left. So please, uh, you can ask your question just right now. Thank you. Marie? Uh, hi, I, I tried to say that uh, I didn't really click it. This must be some mistake. I saw that oh, I, really, okay. I, I really didn't understand the question. So. I'm, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry. No, it's OK. Uh, I chatted. I told you, well, OK. OK, I have one question. Um, um, no more question in the, uh, yes. Jan McDonald is asking, how is receptive our organizations being to first effort? So I can take that one if you want. I think they're actually being very receptive in a sense that one thing that I always learn from diplomats is that they're actually always looking for input from the technical community and from civil society. And they have often been challenged by the fact that they didn't really find people that were willing to sort of take them through the problems and explain them in more detail. Um, and I think people like Sharif were actually the trailblazers, like they came into that community and started sharing uh, things as part of the GGE. And now it's really up to all of us to continue to take on that baton and actually um, start taking these diplomats with us as we work through technical issues. So overall, my perspective is that they're very, very open to it. But we do have to take a step back when we explain something. We can't immediately dive into the details. We have to kind of start with what we're trying to achieve and where we're trying to go. So that's my perspective, Shiv. Maybe you have some other thoughts. Yeah, it's a learning process for all. We have to realize when we address like different communities that the language might be different. The background, I mean, we need to understand about their background. My experience being part of the UNGGE, a group of all diplomats. So the room was full like of diplomats. They are debating things. They have common background. However, they were extremely supportive, extremely receptive. And uh, when I mentioned, for instance, the uh, first, uh, we had a lot of support. Uh, for such effort, but we need to understand the language, where they are coming from. As I mentioned, some of the articles that they, they, they want to use they need to be adjusted. The process of the open-ended working group was proposed. It took several years for this to materialize. I've been following the UNGGE since 2012, so for eight years. The language has changed. Uh, the open-ended working group has been established. We are lobbying now for the open-ended working group to continue in a different formula moving forward with the support of professionals uh, like the incident responders here attending this conference is very important, really. 
uh, for the success okay. of such efforts. We have uh, one quest one more question, and, and I'm going to read something that Ramanjit Singh Chima uh, wrote uh, on the chat box. As an organization that participates in the UN cyber processes and the first member, I just wanted to share from Access Now how much we appreciate first trying to do more here and how important it is to engage. We have stressed how engaging first another technical expert on incident response is key. And we hope we can do more, more to help. And I'm going to read uh, the following and the last question because we uh, don't have, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, more time. In the UNGGE, do you see people pushing back against these common norms that are being developed? If so, can you talk to that as to how you address their issues? Well, my experience with the UNGGE, you find always like people bringing in uh, articles that are related to their background. So that happens. However, these norms, the ones that I shared, is already agreed upon. They have been accepted by the General Assembly. Nobody is, I mean, really working against them. The, the challenge is how to make them uh, uh, practical, how to apply them. So, so it's the operational aspects of how to make this norm a reality and how to make sure for us uh, belonging to this uh, a community, a community of sea certs, uh, part of this process and part of the solution. Uh, and, and that really uh, should be our uh, effort across uh, different disciplines. Uh, Martin, would you like to add? So, you know, I think you covered that very well, Sharif. Thank you. Okay, uh, so thank you to everybody for participating in this talk and thank you to Martin and Sharif for this great talk. Uh, I hope uh, I see we can see each other soon. And a reminder to all to please stop by gather for a networking event at the end of this call. This, the URL uh, is uh, on the chat box. So uh, see you in a uh, uh, few minutes. Bye. Thank you everyone. very much, everyone. Bye.